Hello and welcome to NordNet. Today we are joined by Konstantin Bach, the CEO of MPC Container Ships. Uh, MPC is one of the largest owners of container vessels serving an intra-regional trading routes. My name is Roger Bernstein. And before we move on, it's important for you to know that this session shall not be considered as investment advice. Our only goal is to learn more about MPC Container Ships as a company and, and of course, its underlying industry. And uh, in May this year, we had a uh, uh, had a talk with MPC where uh, Constantine gave us a, a very good uh, uh, introduction or presentation of the company as well. So I, I, I suggest that all of you who hasn't seen that do that uh, um, after this session. So Constantine, uh, first of all, welcome. Thanks and thanks for having me, Roger. Looking forward to to a discussion. Yeah. So. Uh, Let's get started. You, you, you witnessed historical strong container markets in the first nine months. So can you take us through the numbers? Sure. Um, I mean, there are obviously a few ingredients when looking at the, the container market. Let's start with the, with the global economy. Um, and, and that has continued to improve with GDP growth of around 6% expected for 2021 and, and around 5% expected for 2022. So that's kind of the, the fundament. And, and then more specifically for container shipping, we have also seen quite a strong trade recovery. Uh, and that is uh, roughly 8.2% of TEU, so transported box growth expected for 2021 and somewhere between four and a half or around four and a half percent will be expected for 2022. So, so those are kind of the, the backbone figures. And if you then look um, in general at uh, indicators in the industry, all of them are, or quite a number of them are at historical highs. And I think there it's worth looking at the freight market and the charter market, maybe start off with a freight market where freight rates, so the actual rates to transport a box from A to B are up by, by more than 350%. And, and the volumes are at an historical high. Um, and that is amplified by port congestions and disruptions in the supply chain. Um, we currently have around 375 vessels globally at Anchorage being not sufficiently utilized because of disruptions in the supply chain or congestion. So that's, that kind of exaggerates the, the situation. And then if we specifically look at uh, the markets relevant for us as a company, which is the charter market and the asset market, uh, so sale and purchase market, I mean, the charter rates are up by, by more than 450%. If you look at the indices, and the idle fleet, meaning the vessels that are unemployed globally, is, is only 1%. And that already since January 2021. So we're basically looking at full utilization in terms of vessel capacity, uh, which, is, uh, which is historically seen a very, very strong uh, market environment. And lastly, on the S&P market, if you look at asset prices for secondhand vessels, they are up by more than 400%. Um, so, so overall, very strong figures um, underpinning the uh, historically strong container markets. And um, in May, I guess everything looked very strong uh, back then, but even stronger today. So I, I noticed that you have uh, revised your guidance for the fiscal year 2021 upwards. Uh, but for how long can uh, these, uh, the markets stay at these levels? Do you see any dark clouds uh, in the horizon? Well, indeed, uh, on the back of the strong market, we have uh, revised our EBITDA guidance for 2021 to now uh, 305 to 315 million US dollars, uh, which includes around 100 million in, in gains of, of vessel sales, um, which still have to be handed over over the next couple of weeks. Um, but um, to your question on on longevity of the market um, uh, kind of in this in this condition. As mentioned before, I mean, we, we, we do witness a historically strong market, um, demand growth, high freight rates, charter rates, um, etc. And when assessing the market outlook, in the end, it boils down to an assessment of supply and demand um, developments. And uh, I mean, let's start by, by looking at, at the current market momentum and the short term outlook. I mean, I alluded to some of the key indicators in uh, initially here. Um, but for the next two years, I think the positive thing is we will know what will come to the market in terms of additional supply. The order book is carved in stone. 
if you order a vessel now, it will not come until 2024, 2025. So for the next two years, we do know what will come to the market in terms of new supply. And that is pretty encouraging because that is fairly limited. Um, so any market uncertainty during that period will, will be linked to the demand side. Forecasting the demand side has, has always been uh, challenging. Um, and, and I mean, I have been wrong in assessing that and others as well, especially over the last two years where we have seen trade war and, and, and COVID. Um, but I would say at present, a lot of the indicators on the demand side look very promising. I, I did mention the GDP growth expectations of 5% for next year. Generally, inventory levels are low, especially in the US, which is obviously a signal for additional demand. And there's still a demand backlog um, due to the supply chain disruptions. Um, so I think overall that that is uh, that is very positive and suggests that we will see a, a longer uh, positive uh, market. Uh, and that is not just you know the market parameters; it's actually also supported by actual facts and transactions. An example: um, last week we announced our Q3. Um, earnings and we also in that connection announced that we were able to extend four vessels or the charters for four vessels that will only expire in Q4 2022, Q1 2023. So that means we have forward extended charters by two years, um, which is a very strong signal because it underpins the, the firm belief of our counterparty on that very charter uh, that the market will remain strong for a, a longer period. Um, and, and that is actually being extended at, at today's charter rates. Um, I would say a very positive kind of data point in addition to just you know the the, the macro um, data points and that is out of our, our very real life um, if you then look at the kind of midterm and you you questioned are there any dark clouds obviously in the midterm the supply side uh, might still be affected because there have been quite a few orders um, i'm sure we'll touch on that uh, um, later on in the discussion um, and the demand side is less certain right so we're not you know, the disruptions can happen on the demand side, as we have observed over the last two years. Um, and that is a crystal ball question to some extent. In particular, you further you go out um, uh, that route. But in the midterm and, and long term, we cannot rule that out. Um, but also, there are no data points that suggest it's going to happen. Um, and, and we as a company, we position ourselves in a way that we, we will also continue to delever our balance sheet. Um, in order to, pre to be prepared for whatever ever happens and to be in a position to return capital investors in basically every time or every, every part of a, a shipping cycle. Yeah. So uh, if I understand you correctly, the GDP part is very important for you. Also, did the stimulus zero interest rates um, many places around the world and um, it's, it's very favorable to, to your business? Absolutely. That, that obviously GDP is, is to some extent a driver, not a direct driver. In the past, people have always looked at container shipping be a multiple of GDP growth. Um, that I would argue, and, and in the past, people said sometimes, you know, two to two and a half times GDP growth. That I wouldn't uh, think is the case anymore. Uh, but I think GDP growth is the fundament for, for good container market growth. Um, and if you look for next year, I mean, the expectation is 5% GDP growth and around 4 to 4.5% global trade growth in TU terms. So I think there you can see the link to, to quite some extent. Yeah. And let's move on to the, to what's all, what shipping all about. It's, it's, it's all about the generating cash and distributing this to the investors. So, and, and because it, it, it's no doubt one of the most competitive industries out there, uh, Next year, you will start distributing uh, dividends quarterly. Is that correct? What, what, what can we expect going uh, forward, Konstantin? Uh, uh, will there be both recurring distributions and extraordinary, extraordinary dividends? Uh, or, or, and what about uh, share buybacks? Um, yes, um, and, and, and to your point, I mean, indeed, uh, history has proven that shipping is a cyclical industry. So um, in my view, shipping is almost a pure capital allocation business. So you need to do the right thing at the right point in time. So one element is prices paid for assets. That, that, that is one of the key factors in, in subsequent full cycle returns and generating those returns. So there are times to invest, deploy capital, and there are times where an emphasis should be placed on returning capital to investors. Um, and we at MPCC, we have started off with a very clear focus 
strategy around value dislocation in the second-hand container market um, and have bought vessels at a significant discount to new building parity, mainly 2017, 2018 at an attractive entry point. So now, you know, we are in a situation where we generate significant cash um, and that's where we are today. And, and I firmly believe that discipline and rational decisions is, essen is essential, especially in shipping and not being tempted to order new ships uh, when everyone does it, but to take the right decision and also to return capital to investors. Um, and that's why, you know, during the, the last few months, we have worked a lot on optimizing the balance sheet to be in a position to distribute a significant part of our uh, cash that we generate to investors. And now to your question on, on in what form and shape are we anticipating to do that. Um, so going forward, we will be prioritizing returning capital to investors by paying out firstly a recurring uh, distribution of 75% of adjusted net profit as recurring distributions from operations. Um, and additionally, event-driven distributions, which is either by way of an extraordinary dividend or potentially also share buybacks. Um, and that is, for example, linked to extraordinary events such as the sale of vessels, right? So if vessels are sold, which is not the, let's say, the ordinary profit generation um, uh, from operations, uh, but obviously part of our uh, um, um, business, we would then, you know, consider how to return that capital most efficiently to investors. So to your, to your point um, of how do we do it, we will definitely have a recurring element which will be significant, um, but we will also um, from time to time and subject to certain events also distribute additional funding by way of extraordinary dividend and or share buyback. So let's uh, dig a little bit deeper on, on this topic. As of uh, Q3 2021, you, you own and operate 25 container vessels, whereof 67 are fully owned and eight are operated in joint venture. This year you have added, I think, 12 vessels to your fleet and divested nine. So can you talk a little bit more about the, the rationale behind these transactions? Sure. I mean, we view active and professional asset and portfolio management as, as a key factor of being a successful shipping company across cycles. Um, and indeed, we have been both a seller and a buyer of vessels during 2021. And I'm, I'm very happy to elaborate a bit on, on why, why you can be a buyer and a sale, seller at the same time in the same market environment. So on, on the sales side, we have carried out, it's actually 11 vessels that we've sold through, throughout this year. Um, we have carried out a few strategic sales, um, um, which, which for 11 vessels, which we had initially bought for 100 million, roughly, and we have sold them for more than 250 million today. So um, the rationale behind these sales is, first of all, most of the vessels that we have sold were slightly smaller, slightly older units. Uh, and most of them also had their next class renewal coming up. So quite a significant CapEx requirement. Um, secondly, the sale of these vessels was, uh, was a component in our global refinancing efforts. That, that will and now enables us to free up more than 50% of, of our vessels from being a collateral to any financing. So we wanted to kind of have high balance sheet flexibility um, and hence also a high degree of discretion about our capital allocation decision, in particular towards dis distributions to investors. And lastly, um, obviously selling vessels when, when we deem the price attractive is, is, is part of our DNA and in line with our goal of, of returning attractive uh, or making attractive returns to, to investors. So, so that's, that's how we looked at the, at the sales. Um, at the same time, the charter market is still attractive as well. So we're not going to sell off everything by no means because we believe we can also generate significant value from chartering out vessels to maintain a sustainable dividend, but uh, to be a seller um, is sometimes uh, certainly uh, a, an advisable move as well. Now, that's the selling side. Now, looking at the uh, um, buyer uh, buying part or acquisition part, we have also been able to capture opportunities in 2021. And there, you know, we have been basically able to arbitrage between the disconnect between asset values and charter values. And that disconnect has certainly been present pre-summer um, where one was able to buy a ship at a certain price 
and then you know charter it out when it became open at a basically implied premium. So you know the charter value, the value of the charters that we were able to lock in, was significantly above the value that we paid for the vessels, and uh, and, and that that we felt was was a very attractive arbitration um, that we we were able to to get done. In addition, we bought slightly larger, slightly younger vessels, so we were also kind of adjusting our average age profile, average size profile. Um, Having said that, um, and one one was obviously the acquisition of the Songa container fleet um, uh, just pre-summer. Um, but that previous gap between asset values and charter rates has somewhat disappeared. So the market is now pricing a bit more efficiently, which in turn means um, at the moment um, to, to buy a significant fleet of secondhand vessels, I would probably be a bit more cautious. Um, and be again rational in our capital allocation uh, uh, decisions. Um, and in fact, looking at where our stock is trading, the cheapest ship you can buy is actually our own stock uh, rather than a secondhand vessel in the market. So um, that's why, you know, as long as we can, you know, get a good deal done, a rationally good deal done, we would pursue that. But at the moment, I think asset prices and charter values have kind of closed the gap. So, so that's why we haven't executed any deal in the, in the most recent uh, past. Yeah, I, I guess the capital allocation part is, is essential in every type of business, especially in yours. But I'm a little bit interested in this arbitra arbitrage. Uh, is, is, is this because of other informational gaps out there? Or can, can you elaborate a little bit on, on that? So. Uh, yeah, it's 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 to some extent uh, linked to also market perspective. I mean, peop some people, uh, you know, think that uh, it's it, it's it's time time to sell uh, because they have a certain maybe different view on on market outlook. Secondly, I think also with our market position being the largest owner of vessels in our our sub segment, we probably also have a bit of an information um, um, advantage, uh, we, and we also we can already line up charters for vessels. Um, that others potentially can't because we can, as for example, the deal that I alluded to earlier, where we are able to forward contract for vessels for Q4, Q1 positions next year uh, and, and the year thereafter. I mean, this is something I doubt very few uh, players in the industry are actually able to, to get done. Um, and that is done by virtue of our market position, our network and our relationships. Um, and that is a that is a certainly a, a benefit. But um, I mean, in the end, it boils down to to also having the right read of the market um, and and understanding kind of value propositions. And um, and and that's on, that's the basis on which we took that decision uh, pre summer that that would be an attractive arbitration, which it eventually turned out to be. Uh, my next question, I, I think you have uh, touched upon it already, but uh, let's, let's uh, talk a little bit more about it. Uh, normally, you see an increase in new builds when the markets are strong. So, uh, are there any signs of that today? Um, yes, uh, clearly. I mean, since, uh, since Q3 last year, so basically September 2020, we have seen quite a significant increase in, in ordering activity activity in particular in the larger sizes. So I think, yes, the order book has increased quite a bit. It's now above 20% if you look at order book to fleet on the water as a ratio. Um, so, and that has come up from 7% uh, mid, mid last year. So there have been quite a few orders, but again, if you drill down into the detail, you will see that most of these orders are 12,000 TU vessels and above actually more than 80, 85% of the order book is in that size bracket. So this is not the vessels that we operate uh, that see a significant competition from the order book. It's the, the larger vessel uh, trades in, in particular. Um, and, and that in combination with the, the pure H profile um, is, is, is very interesting to, to assess because the, the H profile in, in our segment on average, you have around 40% of the vessels on the water in our bracket being above uh, 17 years of age. So uh, there is a natural need to renew the fleet in the next five, 10 years, um, whilst the order book is not fully reflecting that. So I would actually argue in our very size and segment, we would need more orders um, down the road, um, but it's also more challenging to order a new building in the smaller sizes because of the 
worldwide trading pattern and the high flexibility requirements for smaller vessels. They are the flexible part of the uh, of the trading pattern. And if you order a big 12, 15,000 TU container ship, you know where this ship trades today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. And you can also kind of take a view on uh, fuel supply, uh, in particular when you look at future fuels and propulsion technology, etc. It's a much easier judgment call to have a flexible vessel in terms of propulsion and fuel on a larger vessel also cost-wise because the relative cost compared to the building price is, 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 uh, is smaller um, compared to a smaller vessel. So, so I think there are a few drivers that, uh, that make the order book uh, look a bit more geared towards the large ships. And in turn, I, I certainly think that we need more smaller vessels um, being ordered. But we, for, for our part, have decided not to order new ships. We believe this is not the right thing to do at this stage. We believe it's about the right time to deploy capital. And that was the last couple of years. And now it's time to return capital to investors rather than investing into new builds. I have a, a couple of questions left, uh, Constantine. So... MPC, so you are you, MPC Container Ships is a tonnage uh, provider within the container shipping. Uh, can, but can you give us some some insights to the inner workings uh, of your industries? Who are the big players and who are your uh, uh, rivals uh, and so forth? Sure. I mean, I mean, first of all, when you look at at, at shipping, um, people obviously are well familiar with the dry bulk space, with the tanker space, uh, and people always say it's dry tankers and containers as the three main segments. I I think one needs to differentiate quite a bit because container shipping is part of a very complex and quite broad logistical chain. So container shipping is actually logistics, or it's at least part of a logistical chain and a supply chain. And this year has proven once again how true this is, because we have seen all these disruptions, which are not necessarily disruptions on the, on the let's say, on the sea route. Those are quite a bit of disruption in the interface. So terminals in the US, I mean, I think this is a picture everyone sees almost on a daily basis, right, in the media, um, or hinterland logistics, um, supply chain disruptions, uh, truck drivers, chassis not being available, container boxes not being available. And that gives you an idea of the complexity of container shipping compared to other sectors. And I think that's important to note. I always talk of container shipping as being more of a logistics um, um, uh, sector than a shipping sector in a way you look at dry bulk or, or tanker. So that's maybe just to, to set the scene a bit on the container shipping in general. And then, you know, our the inner workings of our industry, obviously we as a tonnage provider, our customers are charters of this planet. I mean, Merck Line, Hapag Lloyd, Costco, CMA, CGM. So the big liner operators who are the logistics companies, they are our customers. We own and operate the assets. Um, we are chartering them out to Merck Line, for example, for a fixed period on the basis of a mutually agreed charter party at certain terms, period and uh, rates. And we are responsible for providing technical maintenance, the manning, so crewing, classification and insurance of the ship uh, as, as examples. And they are responsible for the cargo and for employing these ships in global trades. Um, we, in turn, earn a fixed charter rate. Uh, obviously, that's driven then by demand and supply for vessels um, um, at the time of, of the fixture. And then our customers, um, they operate the vessels uh, on, on their regular schedules, um, service routes globally to transport booked cargoes on, on those vessels uh, between uh, ports uh, or basically also door to door to some extent. And they cover the, the voyage related expenses such as fuel costs, port fees, um, in addition to charter hire, obviously. Um, and generally, liner operators like Maersk have a roughly 50 50 mix of charter tonnage and own tonnage. Uh, so we are then providing part of the charter tonnage. And, and then we have a very specific focus in addition, and that focus is on intra regional trades. So, so we have vessels up to 5,000 TU. Um, and if you look at the intra-regional trades in terms of number of vessels deployed, this is the most relevant and largest trades globally, actually. It's bigger than the mainline trades from Asia to, to the US or Asia to, to Europe in terms of number of vessels, right? Um, 
And in that very field, you know, 97% of the vessels operating in intra-regional trades are actually below uh, 5,000 TU in size. So this is the market where we specifically focus on. This is also what differentiates us from other stock listed tonnage providers like C-SPAN or, 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 or Costomare or Danaos who, who more generally have larger vessels on the main lane trades. Um, and they usually have higher leverage. So we have way, way lower financial leverage as well. Um, and that's kind of how we position ourselves. And this is also the sweet spot that we will adhere to in our strategy going forward. Yeah. Okay. So my last question, Constantine, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it some concluding remarks. Uh, that's one. And what, what will be, uh, and, uh, in addition, what uh, will be your top priorities uh, go, going forward? I mean, our, our top priorities are, let's say, in the very short term, we are, we are in the process of now executing our balance sheet optimization. This will take place over the next couple of weeks. So until the end, we will have kind of freed up a part of our fleet from the financing structures. We will have a, 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 a very solid balance sheet uh, and we will have a very high cash generation capacity. Um, in order to to do what we have promised, uh, and that is obviously the biggest priority: returning capital to investors. So um, uh, that will be the clear focus going forward: to do it in the most efficient way, um, and to operate the vessels very efficiently. To do a very kind of take take very prudent decisions when it comes to potentially selling or chartering vessels, and certainly to uh, distributions. And we will certainly adhere to to our principles of, of what we deem a very transparent and, and active and certainly rational capital allocation, um, as we have dem demonstrated uh, since inception of, of the company. So, so for our shareholders, in my view, what, what we can offer is we offer a attractive risk return profile, given the low financial leverage, the high visibility on earnings, and the dedication and commitment to returning capital to investors. Um, in order to, to, to achieve basically good uh, yields um, uh, on a full cycle basis for in, in container shipping. Um, then the capital allocation, I touched on that, um, obviously as a, as a key ingredient. And then uh, I would say to some extent opportunistic pursuit of um, accretive transaction. And we always look on a per share basis. So what, what is accretive on a per share basis within our defined strategy? And, and of course, very importantly, now that we have these charter backlogs to ensure professional and reliable portfolio management, also for our customers, but certainly also to, to generate cash. So to sum up, um, I think returning capital investors is now the time. We have had time where we deployed capital um, and built the company. And now it's certainly time to harvest on that basis and take the right decisions going forward uh, and start with the, in, with the first distribution in Q1 next year. Um, and that we have communicated as part of our Q3 announcement. Um, and this is what we now uh, work towards. Um, and we will in all likelihood convene an EGM in the not too distant future, latest early next year, in order to get all the authorities in place from our shareholders in order to then also pay out accordingly. Okay, very good, Konstantin. Uh, First of all, I'd like to thank you for your time and your insights. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and we, we will keep in touch, hopefully, uh, within uh, summer next year. So we can, and, and uh, of course, um, MPC, your, your company is quite popular at, uh, at, uh, at Nordnet. At, I, will, I, I think we have 12 to 13,000 of our customers that own shares in, in your company. So, okay. So thank you. Roger, many thanks for having me. Looking forward to catching up again and uh, uh, all the best. Take care. Thank yes. you. Yes, goodbye. Bye bye.